Chapter 6 Sneak Attack From then on, I took a special interest in Japan. I read everything I could find about it, including articles in newspapers and the few magazines in our school library. To my dismay, things in the island nation began to change in an unexpected way. Their military leaders had decided not to rely on help from the rest of the world. They would go to war to get all those things they needed. They were great warriors, those Japanese, and had been for hundreds of years. In the past, no enemies had ever been able to invade their sacred islands. Now, though, their interest was not in defense. They built up a big army and a navy and attacked other countries around them. Soon they had defeated the Chinese and taken over many other islands in the Pacific Ocean. They said it was their divine destiny. The whole Pacific Ocean was meant to be theirs alone. On the other side of the world, in Europe, the Germans were saying similar things. It was Germany's destiny to rule their part of the world. They, too, went to war and conquered other nations around them. They formed an alliance with the Japanese. Many people in America were now worried. They feared that the time might come when America would have to go again over to Europe and fight as they had done in my grandparents' time during World War I. And America had soldiers and sailors in the Pacific Ocean, in the Philippine Islands, and on the islands of Hawaii. They might soon have to defend themselves from the Japanese. For most Navajos, though, the possibility of a war was very far away. Caring for their herds and trying to make ends meet was all they had time to think about but our Navajo Tribal Council passed a special resolution in June of 1940. I liked their words so much that I made a copy of them on a piece of paper to carry with me in my wallet. I've kept those strong words all these years, though I have had to recopy them several times when the paper they were printed on grew worn from being folded and unfolded, or when it was soaked by the salt water as we landed on those beaches. It is often that way, you know. Strong words outlast the paper they are written upon. Here is what our tribal council said. Whereas the Navajo Tribal Council and the 50,000 people we represent cannot fail to recognize the crisis now facing the world in the threat of foreign invasion and destruction of the great liberties and benefits which we enjoy on the reservation. And, whereas there exists no purer concentration of Americanism than among the first Americans, and, whereas it has become common practice to attempt national destruction through sowing the seeds of treachery among minority groups such as ours, and whereas we hereby, hereby serve notice, that any un-American movement among our people will be resented and dealt with severely. And now, therefore, we resolve that the Navajo Indians stand ready, as they did in 1918, to aid and defend our government and its institutions against all subversion and armed conflict, and pledge our loyalty to the system which recognizes minority rights and a way of life that has placed us among the greatest people of our race. If our help was needed, we Navajos would be ready. But when the attack finally happened, it seemed that no one was ready. It was December 7th, 1941, a Sunday I will never forget. Bright late autumn sun was shining through the windows of our dormitory, but there was no sun in my heart. In the other corner of the room, several of my friends were laughing and talking, but I was in no mood for anything but silence. I was still smarting from what had happened to me two days before. I was so embarrassed. Although, as I have explained, I tried to be careful when I spoke our sacred language, that Friday I had been caught. Mr. Strait overheard me greeting one of my friends in Navajo when I thought no teachers were around. It didn't matter that I could now speak English as well as any Bileganga. It didn't matter how good my grades had been in all my classes. 
by speaking one word in our sacred language, I had just proved to my teacher that I was as hopeless as the rest of my people. Do you want to always be an ignorant, useless savage, Begay? Mr. Strait had said in a disappointed voice, looking down at me over the top of his glasses. You must always speak English. Navajo is no good. No good at all. Then he had placed me in front of the whole class with a dunce cap on my head. That Sunday, as I sat by the window in the dormitory living room, I had my hand on my head, remembering how that dunce cap felt and how foolish I must have looked to everyone, even though my classmates had all politely averted their eyes from me while I was up there. I was both sad and angry. Would the Biliganga never respect me because I was a Navajo? Did I really have to give up everything Navajo to succeed in the modern world? Suddenly, Tommy Nez came running into the dormitory living room. We've been attacked, he shouted. It was on the school radio. Some of us looked out the windows to see if the enemies were close by. All that we saw were the familiar hills and the dusting of snow that had fallen the night before. We left the dorm and went running to the main school building where the radio was located. Mr. Strait was at the front door. Come with me, Mr. Strait said. His voice was tight and nervous. He led us all into the hall outside the main office to listen to the radio. It told a terrible story. The Japanese had attacked the United States at a place called Pearl Harbor. Most, if not all, of our planes and boats were destroyed. Many people died. We turned to our teacher, but he looked as confused as we felt. No one seemed to know what to do or say. Perhaps those Japanese will attack the Navajo reservation next, Tommy Nez whispered. Be quiet, Mr. Strait snapped, pushing his glasses back up onto his nose so hard that he knocked them off and had to grab them before they hit the ground. Everyone back to your dorm. We did as he said, but nothing was the same anymore. Our whole world had changed. What was going to happen now?